Former Taunasja claims Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael should focus on the supports of independence rather than the Green Party to form a government. Formal talks on a programme for government get underway tomorrow. Senator Michael McDowell told News Talk it's likely a new administration will have to focus on the economic crisis from the outset. They have gone in there in their own heads, uh, you know, to, to, to address the world climate crisis. And suddenly now they're going to be asked to confront the Irish domestic fiscal crisis. That's it for now. More in an hour. News Talk Weather. Thanks to the AA. Need to renew your AA home insurance? Go online to the aa.ie forward slash my AA. Some showers in parts tonight, especially in the south and west. Lows temperatures of 7 to 11 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. Off the ball. This, this is News Talk. Hello there, so coming up on the evening show, we'll take a walk down Champions League memory lane. What could have been Everton? Kevin Cuban and Leon Osman will relive the horrors of Villarreal in 2005 when the Champions League beckoned. On Wednesday Night Rugby, as usual, we'll have Keith Wood. We will also be joined by All Black World Cup winning captain Sean Fitzpatrick between 8 and 9. He's in really good form. That is on the way. Plus, Pat Nevin on the football show. Amongst other things, he will uh, remember the Alex Ferguson he came across when he was involved in the Scottish setup under Jock Steen. So that's on the way after 9 o'clock. 53106 is the text number. We are at Off the Ball on Twitter. Richie McCormack, as ever, hello. Even Joe, how are you? I'm very well and very happy to say as well. Ronan Mullen, it has been too long. I don't think we have seen each other in person since the, what, 16th of March? And here we are, looking at each other for the first time in, in some form or other. How are you doing? All good, Joe. It's good to see you all. How are things? Things are interesting, but they're not so bad. We've settled into a routine. And you, I'm surprised that you even have time to take this phone call amidst all the haranguing that must have come your way all afternoon. I am, of course, talking about Mount Rushmore, the loud edition, you and Dan McDonnell, OTBAM this morning. You came up with your four. You came up with your four. Steve Staunton, he's in there, unimpeachable. First name on the team sheet, Steve Staunton. No qualms from me. Rob Carney, again, Ireland's... He is Ireland's most decorated rugby player, isn't he? Like, he literally is one well, more than anyone. We were, I was rattling through his role of honour on the show earlier, and it's just astounding when you go through it. Like, it took me about two minutes just to do the Ireland stuff. That's, like, notwithstanding, unbelievable career with Leinster and two Lions tours and the whole shebang. So, yeah, just, like, two Grand Slam uh, started for both Grand Slam teams. So just a, a real totem of, those, of this whole period of Irish rugby, really. Yeah, so, look, no arguments. And then, I mean, look, you have Gary Kelly, two World Cups, Champions League semi finalist, 531 appearances for Leeds. That's 531. So nobody outside of the Don Revy era comes even close. And, uh, so, you know, one club man, loyalty. He did play twice in the 1992 league winning season, though even he wouldn't really push that uh, thoroughly. So he's the third name on the. Wait, what? 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 Mm. What's this? Gary Kelly doesn't feature. Well, Ronan, <clears throat> you're going to have to explain something to me here. Here, Gary Kelly was the least of my worries, Joe. All right, uh, I was. I got some stick about Gary Kelly, and to be honest, I I was. I did have a little bit of regret, and so did Dan, that we didn't get to really. Like he's been, he was, as you said, an unbelievable footballer, but a real contributor to the draw, the ethos, really, and just uh, he had this. He's this cancer research centre, mm. which has done great things in that part of the community. So. We, we wanted to tap into a bit of that, but I think we went about 10 minutes overtime as it was. <laughs> and the bone of contention was uh, when we got into the GAA section because I wanted some sort of demarcation where I had Stan as my soccer representative, uh, Carney as the rugby representative, then sort of a Gaelic Games guy, and then the best of the rest, sort of miscellaneous section. But mm. it was just thrown for a loop when uh, I was going for Paddy Keenan from the more present day, and then Dan went to bat for the 57 loud All-Ireland winners. So there was... We ended up debating that for about 20 minutes. And in the end, neither of them ended up on the Mount Rushmore. So Gary Kelly didn't even get a look in the whole thing, really. Dear, oh dear. I must confess, I must confess, I'm sure loud people know Tony Soxburn and Tommy McConville incredibly well. They wouldn't be names which would have jumped out to me before listening to the discussion this morning. Full discussion is available on offtheball.com. So Tommy Soxburn and Tommy McConville, we're talking about League of Ireland and boxing legends here. Yeah, so I went for Tony Soxburn in that final category, um, 56 medalist, like I mentioned earlier on. Delaney got most of the plaudits in 56, but, you know, our boxing team was stellar as ever, four medals at those games, and he was the captain of the boxing team, uh, got bronze. So 
like he's just such a revered figure in Drogheda that I felt even though I was wearing a the dog jersey for the segment I had to give them a little bit of love and he <laughs> was their representative because there's a statue of him in Drogheda already there's poetry written about him you know as I said a revered figure so mm. I thought it only fair that he would get in and then Tommy McConville ultimately that's where it fell down uh, Paddy Keenan was my selection uh, all-star in 2010 a Roy the Rovers figure just the best probably the best or most impactful loud sports person I've seen personally with my own two eyes mm -hmm. and he was my he was my choice but me and Dan was going for Stephen White from 57 and ultimately he with his one change he put Tommy McConville in for Paddy Keenan and Tommy McConville just a real storied figure in for Dundalk FC one of the best League of Ireland defenders ever made 580 appearances for the club so you won't hear any you know quabbles from me on on mm -hmm. him getting in but it's just the way these things play uh, have you done the Kildare one yet? No, I don't think it's happened. I don't think it's happened. Like I, I don't passing off the responsibility task. there quickly, Ronan. I don't, I don't envy the task because I, I went in with a sort of a, a quasi or a mesh <coughs> Izzy Ling perspective, which was this is a celebration of loud sport, <laughs> and then the Paul Rouse thing of I want to see these people if I'm going to put them on the Met Rushmore. Yeah. So that was kind of my understanding. And for the last ten hours, it's just been recriminations, people giving out that uh, such and such should have been in. So. It's a Can loud as a weak left candy show, but we're stacked with sporting talent. Can I throw a left field one in there? Because anytime the, the mention of, of, of Sox Burn comes up, I just hear that name being uh, mentioned uh, in the voice of Jimmy McGee because he would have you know, been raised in several boxing commentaries. I think he would have come up in a couple of Jimmy's famous Olympic commentaries down the way. And who was raised in Cooley and County Louth? Only one James McGee. Is there a case to be said that possibly the greatest ever sports broadcaster, sorry, Joe, that this country has ever produced? Is deserving of a place in the sporting Mount Rushmore. I don't, I don't think so. I don't think. I so. gave him a solid shout out. Now I also gave Hugh Holland a shout out. So there was a lot of people getting this <laughs> thing. But Jimmy Jimmy not typically did, a hurling strong. If we start extending it to broadcasters and all that kind of stuff, where does where does it end? Where does it stop? Then we're back. Well, then we're back to JP McManus. Then Jimmy. Jimmy's a special case. Yeah, I think everyone has a Jimmy McGee memory. Like obviously Katie Taylor, yeah. 2012, Bernard Dunn, 09. But even going back to. Um, the Maradona goals. Like if you were doing the Mount Rushmore of World Cup goals, yeah, the two Maradona goals against England would be up there. And Jimmy McGee's dulcet, cooly tones were all over those goals. So yeah. I think, you know, was it eleven Olympic games, ten World Cups, or vice versa? You know, yeah. one of the longest-serving sports broadcasters in history. And Richie, are you familiar with Tommy Smith with the Y? Yeah, absolutely. Over in America, mm. back of the Onion Bike. Like we didn't even get to mention him. Like. This guy was a painter and decorator, rocked up in America when they got the rights to Italian 90, said, do you need anyone to do a couple of matches? And here we are in 2020, he's still doing it. So another, you know, storied broadcaster. I wasn't the first broadcaster to come out of loud. So, uh, <laughs> there, there have been, there has been a precedent. Jimmy's credentials are not being called into question, I hasten to add, but we're keeping this to sports people. It's hard enough with just sports people. God, you got me thinking, I hadn't thought about the Gildare one. So Ruby Walsh Paddy, is up there, Paddy, that's for sure. Paddy Keating, Joe, right? So yeah. Dan's argument was, I basically said Paddy Keenan, and I consulted people who were around in 1957, this, this 1957 team is still celebrated, and I know what it meant to people. What and did I know they do in 57, Ronan? Sorry to interrupt. Did they win anything, or Leinster? Or? They had won the All-Ireland in 57. They won the All-Ireland? Yeah. No, that's get out most, of town. That's their most recent. <laughs> um, so Lowe so have won the All-Ireland since Mayo had last won the All-Ireland. Well, listen, come on. <laughs> it's a small fry, but... Um, <laughs> So Dan went for Stephen White, who was the, probably the cream of that team in 57. And it's totally fair enough. But yeah. I've seen Paddy Keenan play. And I kind of consulted people who were there in 57 and said, basically, was Paddy Keenan on a level with these guys? Because that's all I needed to know was, like, this, I saw Paddy Keenan myself, but just to sort of quantify it mm. in those terms. And it's not his fault, as I said earlier. He's not, he can't be a victim of his birth certificate. Like, it's not his fault he was born into an era where allowed to have no tenable chance of, mm. of winning you know, an All-Ireland. Mm. And 10 years ago, he had them on the brink of a Leinster Championship, had this unbelievable block, which would be the enduring image of loud Gaelic football for the next 50 years, were it not for the fact that Joe Sheridan subsequently dove over the line rugby mm. style mm. and scored a try to Rob Loud. So not only has Paddy Keenan been robbed Legit of a Leinster medal, Legit 10 McCall. years later, Dan McDonnell has robbed him of a place on Mount Rushmore. So when this guy can't catch a break. When will the pain end? And what cause has the Twitterati of Loud taken up most vehemently with you? Well, it's just the fact that having spent, I would say, 50% of the segment, which was 40 minutes, debating which GA member should go on Mount Rushmore, 
No one did yeah. in the GA section, so I think that's the main problem. It sounds and, to me uh, like you've made an absolute mess of this. I'm going back to listen to this full <laughs> conversation to see how it transpired. Well, Steve, Steve Staunton, Joe, well, that was a no-brainer. Sure. And me and that was, there was consensus there. Rob Carney, as we said, hugely decorated. Yeah. And then it was, it was in the last two where it all falls down. But I think you'll find on most Mount Rushmore's that's going to be the case no, because true. the Wexford one, as enjoyable as that was to listen to, Tyke Verlon and Gordon Darcy were nowhere near it. So... Mm. Um, I think, I think most counties are going to find this problem. I would have to query the methodology, though. What's wrong with having two football people up on Loud's Mount Rushmore? It's probably, like, Loud, you think of Loud, Loud is just, like, the ultimate football county, like, the, the football town, you know? So, I think Gary Kelly, two World Cups. Oh, yeah. I, don't make, I don't want to make you feel worse than you already feel here. I can tell you're, you're in a bit of pain. But I just, I was, I, 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 at, at first glance, at first remove, I thought to myself, Stan... Carney, Gary Kelly, and a GAA person. That's what I thought. Now, to be fair, I wasn't aware of Tony Soxburn. What about Ian Hart? Ian Hart didn't have as good a career as Gary Kelly. I don't know. It's debatable, Joe. One World Cup versus two. That's Sports circumstance more than else. Yeah. Spectacular goal. Also part of that Leeds team that got to the semi-final of the Champions League. Look, don't put me in, in the position where I'm talking down somebody who had an extraordinary career as well. I have to pick one of them. I have to pick one. I'm going with seniority. I'm going with the uncle. What about uh, boxer Tom Sharkey, Joe? Are you familiar with him? No. So he was born in Dundalk in 1873. Ran ah, away here. from home. No, no, no. Ran no, away no. from home when he was 12. <laughs> no, stop now. Here, there's another, home when he was 12. there's another bone I want to pick with you. There's another bone I want to pick with you before we get into the news rent. Okay, cool. I'm in the midst of the Last Dance. Oh, yeah. I'm fully up to date. Episode six has been ticked, done. Very enjoyable. Really enjoying this. It's good and very much enjoying Off the Bull as well. My takeaways from the latest episodes. He's getting free deals all over the place here, Jordan, isn't he? I mean, I know his production company are involved with this thing, but I mean, really, 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 really. They, like, the Isaiah Thomas stuff was, like, it was, <laughs> it was a terrible treatment of the whole situation. And then even on the... Republicans buy sneakers too thing. That mm. wasn't teased out enough with him. You know, he's saying, oh, I, I, why, why do I have to be a role model? And, you know, I didn't ask for any of this. And literally they're showing footage in the previous segment of the, was it the Gatorade ad where it's be like Mike? I mean, I've ne ne Tiger Woods is the same. Ne never has someone so consciously, I mean, look, I guess he's not the architect, but presented themselves as a role model. He's going around giving Gatorades to Gatorade to kids saying be like Mike. So he can't really have it both ways. How do we feel? Here's the broad question. Mm. How do we feel about Michael Jordan, the person? Well, the Republican thing has followed him around ever since he said it, really. And mm. it was, he mentions in the documentary that it was an offhand remark at the back of the bus. And for some reason, it's come to define a huge section of how he's perceived. And I do have a couple of qualms with the prescribed nature of role model status. Like, not yeah. everyone signs up. I don't know if that should be an automatic thing where you reach a certain level of profile and you're basically mandated to speak out on social issues that you might not be comfortable with. But didn't might he feel he, qualified he, to he speak did, about. He did cultivate the role He might have thought the, the best way he thing. could contribute was to literally monetarily contribute, yeah. and that's what he did. Yeah. So, I don't know, like, not everyone's Muhammad Ali, Joe. No, I know? get that. I get that. But he did cultivate the role model status. So we can't have it both ways. That's what I just but, felt it came across part of the role, in, in part 2020. Of the role model status, part of the role model status when you've uh, come up and gained your immediate success in Reagan's America doesn't necessarily mean that you have to speak out against the incumbent government. I mean, it's not like it, it, he doesn't have to. He didn't have to back then. And just because we look back on, on Reagan and uh, George Bush Sr. is not the greatest um, people in the world, let's say, or presidents at least, it doesn't mean that Jordan at the time had to speak out about them, um, especially at the time when like, there was a, he, he came into, into the NBA when the Cold War was no, still no, going I, on and I, it was very, I take very much pro-America. I take so, all that. I take all that. But I was just a little bit surprised in episode six. There was, there was episode six. There was almost a woe is me aspect mm. to how he was looking back on it. Like poor tortured me having to be in this position and you know I was just the Republicans buy sneakers thing if it was just a joke and it was an offhand quip you know I get that but it, there was also a, a nugget of truth in there and that's probably how he saw things but I'm not just talking about the politics even just Jordan in his general demeanor Ronan yeah. not the most generous character you're ever going to come across you know and and I, I, I he's so amazing you know he's just so glorious oh. in full flight and it's really brilliant to relive what he could do at all the clutch moments, the competitive nature, phenomenal. But just as a person, 
and you're into this. Is there a, yeah. do, we, do we like him? I mean, are you on Team Jordan when you're listening to him talk and watching his recollections now in 2020? Because I find I'm so on Team Jordan when we're going through mm. the archives, and then it cuts mm. back to Michael with his uh, glass of whiskey, which is just a continuity nightmare, I'm sure. Uh, mm. and, and I just, I, I, he loses me almost instantly every time. Yeah, I'm not sure. Like he himself, when he was doing pre-publicity for this, was saying, "I think people might come away from this thinking I wasn't the nicest of guys." But I would have been disappointed if he was a nice guy. Because mm. does anyone think that these elite sports people are lovey-dovey to their teammates? I remember speaking to you about Kobe Bryant a couple of months ago, mm. and his teammates, even again, a revered character in that dressing room, but it was respecting. It wasn't as if they were best mates hanging out after practice. He set the he set the bar. And if you didn't hit that bar, you know, it was basically get out of town. Mm. And Kobe Bryant was very much in the Michael Jordan mold. So I, I think it's it's kind of fair enough. It, w it w might be ideal if he was a, a nice guy and a social activist and all this kind of stuff, but he wasn't. And as is alluded to in the documentary, if you take that sort of thing out of him, he probably doesn't go to achieve the greatness that he ultimately did. Mm. But, like, the production is just, it's incredible. It's so polished. The montages are Rocky-esque. Yeah. And... I, like as a journalistic enterprise, like even the fact that he left a little Obama remark, I don't know if you saw that in the most recent episodes, but Obama sort of yeah. alluding to his own disappointment yeah. that Jordan didn't speak out. Like Jordan could quite easily have nixed that, no, you know, true. given that he had final say. So he, he, he was all right to leave that in. But this was never going to be Frost Nixon or the mm. OJ Made in America. This was no great journalistic enterprise. Michael Jordan's name is on the poster. Mm. So he's signing off on it. And to a certain extent, while I, although I did say, he left a couple of bits in that might be a little bit distasteful and colour how people see him as a personality. I think, for the most part, he's going to be happy with the final product. And this is the image that Michael Jordan wants to put out to the world. Mm. And it's interesting, he kind of greenlit this. Like, this footage has been around, needless to say, since 1998. And ESPN have been playing around with it. When Bill Simmons launched 30 for 30, they were initially given the raw files and were dying to do something with it. Mm. But it was it's actually this like making a murderer, the O.J. Simpson thing, these long form documentaries, nobody knew that people had an appetite for this. Yeah. There was a Michael Jordan documentary about 15 years ago, which was about 90 minutes. And you can't tell the Michael Jordan story in 90 minutes. It was only when you saw the O.J. one and the scope that what they were able to achieve with that time frame and the fact that people sat down and watched it, that he sort of, they were able to get the price point correct because there's 10 episodes. Advertising can be in such a way that Jordan's like, well, I can make a bit of money out of this. Mm. And also, when LeBron James had this mesmeric comeback with the Cavaliers against the Golden State Warriors, who were the best team since Jordan's Bulls, it was it, it was at that point in 2016 where Jordan was like, right, let's let's green light this thing because I need to remind people that mm. LeBron might be good, but I'm still the best. Mm. And for people who know Michael Jordan, just looking at some of these montages, this was a unique character. Like some of the, even the what might look like a rudimentary layup isn't like yeah. Michael Jordan's doing stuff that no other player has ever done and he probably needed to remind that yeah, or needed no, to remind people of they're all brilliant points to be fair and it's really worth a watch regardless like it's not a whitewash if I've given that impression it's far from it it's it's really good and even the footage of Jordan in the locker room before the NBA All-Stars game in the most recent episode and this 19 year old kid called Kobe oh, Bryant thinks, so good. thinks he's going to come at Jordan and this is a regular theme in the right across the six episodes. Anytime there's any even hint of a pretender to the throne, Jordan doesn't just want to prove, no, I'm still really good. He wants to go after this other person one on one, crush him, humiliate him. And, the, you know, it's just the most, uh, it's like the cameras aren't there the way they're almost talking about this kid Bryant before the game. Have you yeah. seen it, Rich? Uh, not yet. Not okay. yet. Yeah, you it's love it as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You love the soundtrack anyway. But. Yeah. Joe, just on the on the Kobe thing, like that's that's remarkable that Kobe Bryant, at, is. still a teenager, that that the locker room, this this team or this locker room full of MVPs is talking about this young guy in these terms. Like they knew he was the up and comer, and Jordan was almost he could he could sort of infer that this is the next me. Do you know what I mean? He could probably yeah. see himself in Kobe, yeah. and that's why he was so keen to get out there with him. And as I said, just the fact that. The way the other players, like Magic Johnson, comes in to address him, Larry Bird does, mm. the other players on that all-star team are gathered around Michael Jordan. It's like he is in the room full of the most talented players on earth. He's still the alpha. Mm. And then you see it in the Dream Team as well, where he just takes over that practice, which is probably the greatest game ever played, by the way, this uh, behind-closed-doors <laughs> practice mm. between the best players. 
it's like an all-star game, except they were taking it seriously. They were playing for places on the Olympic starting team. Mm. And you saw Magic Johnson throwing the ball with disgust into the into the empty bleachers and complaining that Michael Jordan always gets the calls. Yeah. Like there's just some remarkable footage in this that there is. There if is. nothing else, like we mightn't get the, the grimier nuts and bolts that people might want, but we're definitely getting some remarkable footage that otherwise we never would have seen. Yes, that's perfectly put, and it's highly recommended. So this this is turning into an episode of Off the Bull. You can watch Off the Bull. <laughs> this is you and Jarlath Regan and Kieran Donaghy and Onshi and chatting through this every Tuesday. Yeah, straight after the, it comes out here in, in, yeah. uh, it's in the UK and Ireland. Yeah. It's really good. It's really good. So let's get into news round, Richie. Where are you taking us? We're starting with GEA news. We're, we're, yeah. we're slowly but surely getting some definitives. Yeah, the GEA say that no inter-county games will be played before October. The association also says there's no appetite for playing games behind closed doors, but they haven't ruled out the prospect. They've asked that all inter-county training still happening to, to be suspended immediately. They're seeking further clarity from the government on maintaining social distancing in a contact sport. And they've also announced the formation of a COVID-19 advisory group, which contains GPA Chief Executive Paul Flynn and both the heads of the Camogie Association and Ladies Gaelic. Uh, Bundesliga, meanwhile? Yeah, that's going to return behind closed doors in the second half of this month. Chancellor Angela Merkel held a, a conference call today with the country's 16 regional premiers where the safety protocols surrounding so-called ghost games were agreed upon. May 15th or the 22nd is the expected resumption date. The German Football League, the DFL, will discuss an exact return date at a board meeting tomorrow. 82 matches remain to be completed in the top flight. Elsewhere across Europe, the Turkish Super League will resume on June 12th and the Turkish FA are also holding out hope that is Istanbul will still host this season's Champions League final. The Serbian FA have confirmed a May 30th return for their top two divisions. However, the suspension of team sports in Belgium has been extended until July 31st. The Belgian Pro League will hold a general assembly on May 15th. It's Friday week to decide the best way to complete their season. They're going to head down the France route. The Dundalk Dagger, hashtag loud and proud, said two Mayo men were in the loud 1957 winning team which we have verified. Seamus O'Donnell and Dan O'Neill, both Mayo men, played in the 1957 final for Louth. Robbie, meanwhile, did my radio go on the blink for a few minutes there? Or did you, in all serious, not mention Ian Hart's wand of a left foot? He was, for a time, arguably one of the best dead ball men on the planet. In case you've forgotten, says Robbie. That's at you, Ronan. That's at you. And then somebody oh. else, somebody else, somebody else. What about Des Smith in golf? Good uh, shout. Did Des Smith get discussed because just to remind you of certain credentials, in what is a phenomenally, phenomenally difficult and competitive sport, Des Smith won eight times on the European Tour between 1979 and 2001. That's longevity for you there, Ronan. He played on two Ryder Cups as well, and he did very well on the Seniors Tour. He won five times between 05 and 2012 and was a vice captain uh, with McGinley, certainly, at the Ryder Cup. I mean, Des Smith should have been considered, I would have thought, no? I actually did consult Dan because a couple of people had been on to us uh, suggesting people and I was like, here, Dan, you're better qualified to talk about Des Smith than me. Mm. And ultimately, I don't think, as I said earlier, time constraints, Joe, we just couldn't get around to everybody. But needless to say, Des <laughs> Smith and every other conceivable person that we didn't mention, we have been reminded of it. So, uh, sorry, Des, you know. Yeah, well, I guess you only had, what, 45 minutes to discuss today? It was hard to get around to more than four people. That's it. <laughs> like we... Olympians, Joe, got cursory mentions. Uh, Tommy Byrne, who was on the show before, unbelievable story. The driver, yeah. Uh, two Grand Prix. You know, we only got a, a little mention of them as well. So, you know, as I said, Loud have, we have a bit of a stacked reservoir of talent, so uh, we couldn't get around to everybody. God love whoever has to do Dublin or any of these counties. My well, God. Yeah, that's tricky. At Ronan Reigns is your Twitter account, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a Roman Reigns is a wrestler. Former wrestler, Richie? Current, Current still. Wrestler. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this will be the first time in your two respective lives that the other Ronan Mullen will be like, why am I getting all this abuse? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, dear. Right, that's that's... Very good. I'll just give him advice to close his DMs for the next few days. <laughs> if, if the reverse is anything to go by, that's what I used to do. <laughs> OK, where are we going? Premier League. OK, so with all, the, yeah. all these European leagues coming back, where's, where's Project Restart? 
That's the question. Players and managers are to be presented with medical protocols related to the Premier League's project restart next Monday. The top flight is working on plans to complete the current season amid the coronavirus pandemic. Four club doctors have already expressed reservations publicly about the proposals. It's believed that a 100-point letter has been sent to the Premier League seeking clarity on safety protocols. And the Times this evening claim the kickoff times will be staggered so as to allow as many of the 200 remaining Premier League and Championship games to be televised. However, Graeme Souness feels there will be one major alteration to the top flight landscape when football is allowed to resume. When you're a football club in the Premier League and you're spending more than 75% of your total income on, on wages, <coughs> predominantly on salaries for players, think of that for a minute. It's leaving me with 25% to pay other players, to pay for ground improvements, to pay for training ground improvements and to buy players going forward. So you end up borrowing money and this is an extremely wealthy benefactor. You have to go to the bank and borrow the money. And you go to the bank and say, well, look, over the next five years, we've got this income coming from television, or three years from television, three years of ticket sales, and they'll produce stats. Their ticket sales of their season ticket sales have produced this money every year for the last 10 years. So they get the money off the bank and they're chasing the dream. Well, all those things might not be there for the foreseeable future. So the only obvious cutback, the biggest cutback you can make is players' wages. And, and I'm sorry, it's bad news for players in that league and beyond, and maybe some in the Premier League. You know, th this golden period that they've enjoyed for the last 15 years or so, other, other than the very top men, there's going to be waste cuts coming, no matter how you look at this, there's waste cuts coming for these players. Mm, interesting. And you have Graeme Cummins as well, the Waterford striker, Rich. Yeah, he's speaking to uh, John Duggan this morning on News Talk Breakfast, and he's very sceptical about a late summer return for the domestic game. I really think there's too much risk. I've seen, obviously, the protocol, everything, the ideas, like about players washing their own kit, coming to train them by themselves. But I don't understand how you can have lads training in threes and fours and going from that in two weeks to going to matches where you can contact, proper contact. And there is going to be the risk of like contracting the virus. And unless there's a vaccination, I really don't see a way forward because, like, like you said, I mean, if one person gets it on a team, the whole team then have to go into isolation. And then does that mean that any game they play against the Poland team the week before, that whole team have to go into isolation? And then that would have a knock-on effect on upcoming fixtures. Then where you say, well, these can't be played because this whole team can't play it like and then it's just back to square one so I really I really don't think it's possible at the moment I don't think July is feasible anyway September I don't know like I said with the war you never know what can happen in a few weeks but I think July is a bit soon the way they're talking about vaccination yeah it's hard to argue really the testing capabilities will be all important is there any last story of great importance you want to bring us rich as we wrap up uh, one final one world rugby revealing that there will be 167 people minimum required to deliver a top level rugby match the sports world governing body has compiled a list of all the people who will be involved in a behind closed doors game including playing squads officials medical staff and broadcasting crew the study was performed after world rugby warned that games with supporters were unlikely to happen until there is a COVID-19 vaccine it will be the last sport and among them to resume in this country in August all going well very good Richie McCormick beautifully done thank you Ronan Mullen let's do this again soon thanks Ronan thanks Joe short ad break we are forcing Kevin Kilbane and Leon Osman for their Champions League memory to revisit Villarreal in 2005 that's next and 